as good as human beings, you know, but we'll, we'll try to make it that way. Um, my, my talk today is just a fun one, actually. Uh, tomorrow I'll give you a little bit more of a quantitative talk, but today it's more motivational. So you guys have been, you know, enjoying some really good presentations today and hearing some technical stuff, some financial stuff, economics, uh, entrepreneurial stuff. Um, but my job now is to come here and have us take a step back and try to think big picture of what are we doing. Does it make sense? Are we actually making the world a little bit better with this? So, um, who I am, Rob Viglioni. I'm actually a former military scientist, you know, lo and behold, conspiracy theorist, you know, enjoy that one. Uh, I was a physicist, mathematician, but then I went back for my PhD and actually was fortunate enough to be able to study Bitcoin. And Bitcoin from an asset pricing perspective, I teach a Bitcoin and blockchain course at the University of South Carolina. So, I, I'm very, very, uh, I get to enjoy basically straddling two parts of the space, right? On the, the entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial side, actually working on a cryptocurrency directly, and then also the academic side doing research uh, and teaching and stuff. So it's, it's really fun. Uh, I get to see different parts of the space that maybe if I was just doing one or the other, I wouldn't get a chance to do. So the, the big thing that I want to stress today in this talk is uh, essentially, where's the impact of, of all of this stuff? We have so much money, so many resources, and so many smart people now entering the space, so many innovative people, uh, and the industry is exploding. I mean, at this point, we're probably about half a trillion dollars worth of capital in these markets, between market capitalizations, venture funding, crowdfunding for ventures. So there's a lot of resources entering here, but have we actually produced the social good or the economic value to justify this. Um, I think in some sense, we are creating real value, and I'll talk about that. But in another sense, I, I think we're not there yet. And I wanna challenge people who are in the space to really think big picture and think long term, think about what we can do to actually make society better. Okay, Vitalik from Ethereum had a really good quote um, that, that I grabbed, it was, focus less on profit and more on achievements. And I would like to really stress that. Because so much of what I've seen over the last year, which is just a function of, of prices going exponential, is people are seeing dollar or euro signs kind of flashing in front of their eyes and they're just jumping right into the market. Um, that's fine, you know, because there will be some positive externalities that come out of that. But at the same time, this isn't or shouldn't all be about profit, right? In the end, at the end of the day, we want to make society better. We want to produce some social good. And then we want to also do things that are economically productive, okay? Not the, the, the end result of this economically should not just be creating tokens that people can trade back and forth with, with each other, right? And have a, like the beautiful image over here of Lamborghini going to the moon. That was, uh, I think, one of our, our best marketing pieces that we did. It was a joke, guys. We're not really saying by Zen the price is going to go to the moon. Uh, but we always get asked the question, when Lambo, when moon? So it's, it's a very famous question if you're in this industry. You'll get it all the time. Uh, so it's endearing. Uh, the, the thing is, where's the killer app? Can anyone think about some killer app, something that's absolutely critical in your life, or maybe something that you just absolutely love that's, that's been produced here? I think we have, we have a... Money. Yes, absolutely. Here's where I go. <laughs> Good transition. So I do think that having a universal currency is a killer app. Okay? It's one thing. It's a really important thing. And it's more important when you have situations like it unfortunately unfolding in countries like Venezuela, where maybe the regime that you live under is they're maximizing utility functions that might be different than your own. Okay, is a is a polite, polite academic way to say if you live in a, a jurisdiction that sucks, right? Then then having a universal currency is a really good thing. Okay, there's value in giving people that kind of option. Unfortunately, some people that live in these types of societies don't even have access to global marketplaces. They're in economies where something's breaking down. No hay comida, facing some armed police and soldiers. This is not an enviable position to be in. And oftentimes when we're in the United States or the European Union, we don't see this in front of our faces. Okay? So using Bitcoin as a payment system isn't gonna change my life in the US. We have pretty good payment systems. In Europe, you have pretty good payments, payment systems. For someone who's disenfranchised in a different country is cut off from the global economy, having a universal currency with open access and participation is a beautiful thing. And I argue that this is absolutely a killer app. 
Imagine going to the grocery store and seeing soldiers patrolling the aisles, making sure that people don't, uh, you know, abuse quotas. So this is the world that some people live in, and I argue that that is the first amazing application of Bitcoin. It's not the last though. So we need to think also going beyond Bitcoin and how are we going to create additional value, whether it's economic or social. So. Cryptocurrencies provide extraordinary value for some people, and as of yet, little value to most. Okay, so most people that I know who are dabbling in the cryptocurrency space, they're maybe Americans, Europeans that are enjoying some trading back and forth. Maybe they're enjoying the Lambo prices, um, but really, they're, they're not, their lives, their everyday lives are not impacted by this, other than being able to buy a Lambo maybe if they do well. Right, but they don't have uh, an app on their phone or some other uh, thing that they're using on a daily basis that is absolutely critical to them or that they just absolutely love. Uh, we're not there yet. So Vitalik, uh, Ethereum Vitalik also put together a really good graph about how you can see the kind of first users of this technology, particularly think Bitcoin and Venezuela, they have very high utility to using this stuff. But then there are, as it becomes more ubiquitous and we want to mainstream this stuff, of course, the margin of utility is going to be decreasing, but that's not a bad thing. That just means that hey, if I have a really cool app on my phone that's running on a blockchain, yeah, it gives me some value, but it's not as um, value, valuable on the margin to say someone in a disenfranchised economy. So one thing that's really big for me uh, with working with Zencash is we are a, privacy, a, a, a strong privacy-oriented platform. Okay? We have a strong private cryptocurrency and we have a platform that's built on extremely strong cryptography and privacy. Now, that's important to me, but I don't think that privacy is necessary for every single blockchain application in the world. There's gonna be a whole bunch of them that are perfectly fine running on pseudonymous blockchains, you know, like Bitcoin or you know, Ethereum right now, where say maybe you're creating a video game or something, you don't need extremely strong privacy, but if you are dealing with money, uh, especially in a repressive country, maybe privacy is extremely important to you. So we have to think also, what are we building these systems? What problems are we trying to solve when we build these systems? Because, well, first of all, one size doesn't always fit all, but there's also a thousand different problems that we can think of off the top of our heads that we can build a thousand different types of systems to solve. Okay, so when I, when I think forward in the space, I don't envision a future where there's just one chain to rule them all. I don't. I think humanity has so many varied problems that we're trying to solve, and there are so many different ways of getting at the solutions. And solution spaces are typically dynamic. There's nothing suggesting that we need one static solution to essentially solve all of humanity's problems. Even if you have one really good thing today, five years from now, there could be something better if we iterate on a different permutation of uh, engineering space. So. The, the thing that matters though is, well, privacy is absolutely critical where it matters. That's why I'm personally a believer in building systems that start with extremely strong privacy and security as the standard, particularly for platforms. So if you have a particular application, the application may not need extraordinary privacy, but if you have a platform on which you want an unbounded set of other applications to be built, I think the platform itself, the basic infrastructure, the building blocks, should be built on extremely strong um, privacy. Now, this, this slide is meant to, to give you my, my impression of where I think we're going, and say maybe the, the three to five year range. Um, who knows 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Uh, there's probably a whole bunch of stuff that will exist that we can't even imagine. But in the next few years, I think what will dominate particularly in the privacy space, is the, the idea of selective transparency and its analog selective privacy. So that's how I view, there, there's two ways to view uh, the privacy space even. Uh, and you can look at this in the, in the cryptocurrency domain. You've got cryptocurrencies that force every transaction through maximal privacy, some, some uh, tumbling engine or mechanism that's gonna obfuscate transactions. And you've got others that give you the choice of whether or not you want to have kind of a pseudonymous uh, type of transaction like Bitcoin, or you would have one that's completely obfuscated. So there's two ways to look at this space, and I think that the first one, the, the forcing of all transactions through maximum uh, privacy, I think that this is a great solution for systems that require absolutely top-notch security. But it does bump up against the use case limit. So if you are a merchant, or you're a bank, or you're some other institution, 
any, any, any type of organization where you are accountable to someone else, you probably need some sort of traceability or auditability. So for systems like that, which is what I think is absolutely necessary for mainstreaming the technology, it's really important to have selective transparency in your system. Okay, so that's what we do. That, that's part of my decision rationale. And I think it's gonna become more common as we go forward in the future. Um, the, the, the interesting thing here to think about is that privacy itself, I think will lead to a whole new set of business cases, a whole new set of technologies and ways of looking at, at the world and problem solving that we don't even know about yet. I don't know exactly, clearly I have no idea what the future is gonna bring, but I could just name a few of these ideas right now. In, in the next three to five years, I'm pretty sure we're gonna have some fairly good universal identification program. And universal ID is something that it should definitely be done on a, a strong, secure, private blockchain, not an open blockchain. There's some countries, for instance, like India, that are doing a universal national ID program where all information is being collected into a, a central database. I think that's problematic. That's like one of the biggest honeypots in the world. And whenever you have some sort of economic uh, incentive or honeypot for a database, it will be broken. It will be broken into, the information will be compromised. It's just a matter of time. So I think that that's one solid application. And universal identification is sort of a prerequisite then to getting out, uh, say, banking services to the disenfranchised around the world. Things that we consider somewhat social goods. You know, we talk about this quite often in this industry of we want to bank the unbanked, we want to provide services to people that are disenfranchised. So far, you have really good intentions. We haven't had um, you know, solid execution on these ideas yet. I hope you will. I think it's just a matter of time. We have the resources, we have extremely talented, bright people doing this stuff. And I think privacy is going to be a really big part of that. Uh, fair voting systems. This was something that I didn't think about until we actually started working on it. Uh, the, the ability to uh, obfuscate your decision in an election is absolutely critical to a, a well-functioning democracy. If y your vote could in any way be uh, compromised or what you voted on known to others, that is an influencing function to the electoral process from, from the beginning. Uh, so what we're doing is we're actually building a, a fairly uh, novel uh, voting, voting mechanism built into our software protocol that uses uh, zero-knowledge cryptography to give people the, the ability to cast secret ballots that then are immutable, they can't change, and then once the voting epic is over, they can actually be revealed without compromising the, the original voter. So this is something that we're, we're kind of doing in the, in the blockchain world for our, our particular platform that I would love to see governments one day say, well, th these guys implemented some game theory research into a, you know, a sort of provably fair uh, voting mechanism that works well. Why don't we adopt this for political uh, voting systems? You're probably not gonna see large countries do this, but it'd be really cool. Uh, for instance, I'm also part of a project called the Seasteading Institute. We're building offshore societies, offshore like startup cities. Um, we're doing one right now in Tahiti, so it's beautiful. I recommend everyone please come check it out. Uh, but I could for sure see some of the research that we're doing, if we can actually bring it to production and it works well, be applied to small governments or maybe startup societies in the future. And why not innovate also on the social technology side? And that's really all politics is, is a social technology. Or politics, I suppose. Governance is a social technology. Um, so we should be trying to innovate, and you innovate usually on small scale, and then if it works well, you can scale it up. Uh, I think that users will have really interesting ways to monetize their own data, their own content that they create. So right now, people that love Facebook or Twitter, these other applications, they're essentially giving the companies free data that then that company considers an asset and they monetize. Great for them, they're providing a, a service to the users, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a fair value proposition, maybe. But now we can actually have the, the type of system where users own their content directly and they can choose whether or not to uh, sell it to others or actually just earn income on it. There's actually one blockchain platform right now uh, that is fairly popular in the space called Steemit. Um, I have, I have, my blog is actually on Steemit and I get paid to blog. You know, users go on there and upvote or downvote you whether they, they like your content and you earn direct income based on that. This is a business model that didn't exist five years ago. And I, I, I definitely think it's going to expand into a whole bunch of other domains where anything where you can think of a company 
kind of centralizing and using your data to monetize. Now we can flip that, basically invert it upside down, and now users are directly empowered with their own data. Uh, this could be extremely important for people who, who live in environments with restricted economic opportunity. Can you imagine now you live in a country where the median income is, I don't know, say 5,000 euro, but you can actually earn half that just by blogging, maybe more than that by blogging, and not even blogging in a professional sense, but you know, doing something that you're passionate about and posting the content and have other people actually pay you for that. So I think this opens up a whole new world of opportunity. But again, because we have some potential sensitivities to, you're putting your life onto some, some data structure, it's absolutely critical to have strong privacy built into the primitive. Doing this stuff in a transparent manner, I think is just ripe for disaster. So you should do this stuff on platforms that actually guard at the start you know, maximum security. I think that, at least for me, I'm tired of every, every uh, week or so reading in the news some, some company's data was compromised, some company's servers were hacked, and my information is out into the world right now, or maybe even worse, the information is sold in the dark market and you're being exploited that way. I think that sucks. And now, if, if we could actually get data to the individual, the individual owns the data, it's no longer archived in central uh, databases, then there, this honeypot doesn't exist. And I think that this is one direction that will go in the future. So I'm not, I'm not a very binary guy. I don't look at the world in pure black and white where I think it's gonna be all, all or nothing. I do think that we'll probably live, the truth usually lies in the middle somewhere. And what we'll get with this technology is some industries will be massively disrupted, others will, won't be impacted. Most of the action will probably take place on the margin, in the middle somewhere, where there will be innovations, there will be kind of changes, and what I hope is what we're doing as entrepreneurs, will start driving some of this change. Okay. So ultimately, we want to make sure that what we're doing is going to benefit society. Okay. We don't want just Lambos going to the moon. We want to actually be able to make meaningful impact for people that don't have the same opportunities that we do. We're very fortunate to be alive in this age with so much opportunity that our parents and our grandparents just didn't have. So let's make good use of it. So what you see here today, you know, look at it from the perspective of how could you, how could you contribute? Even if you're, say you're not an entrepreneur, say you know, you're just reading about this stuff, think about how, how could you make a mark in the industry? How could you participate? So, that's all I've got, guys. Does anyone have any questions? Or does everyone get pumped up and want to go change the world? Yeah. All right, cool. you said that uh, strong privacy will be the standard and my question concerning that is uh, are there plans for Zencash to make the shielded transaction uh, default? No, no there, there aren't. Um, so what I mean by it being standard is uh, platforms themselves will have the option for strong privacy but I, I am a believer in selective transparency because there's a whole bunch of business use cases uh, that require transparency and auditability. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. For example, if you're a donation a charity organization, you, you want your uh, donors to see that you're not um, misconstructing the funds. But my problem with the optional privacy is most people won't use it unless they want to be private, in which case you know uh, something shady is going on. So why don't you think about something like um, you have a transaction uh, completely shielded by standard, and then if you retroactively want to reveal that transaction to the world, you can do so. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. It's absolutely in the decision space right now. You know, the computational burden for the type of cryptography we use is quite high. Uh, so right now, it's not necessarily the, the best approach because you, you, you would uh, limit a bunch of use cases, basically. Um, but as the computational burden for this type of cryptography decreases, it's certainly a good idea. Hi, Nick. I was wondering, uh, how do you think private or sec private secure money is making people free or freer than uh, not just as well and as well? Uh, my idea was just off the top of my head was um, to crowdfund money for whistleblowers. I think they are still under huge pressure, not just in China, but in Europe. Uh, there was a five former um, auditor from um, a larger bank who couldn't find a job in the last four years after he blew the whistle 
um, that help those kinds of environment on doing uh, um, due diligence. Mm. We have another selection of how we actually swell to use it as well. Germany and not just in Venezuela. Yeah, I, this is a, a very sensitive issue. Uh, so the, the mainstream thought is you know, who wants whistleblowers around, right? Like if you're a government, do you want to you know, in encourage uh, an economic system or economic mechanism that's going to reward people to point out your flaws? Um, so I, I don't think this will be necessarily coming out of like a, you know, any sort of um, you know, institutional support. But I think the good thing about this industry is that we now have the technology and the economic uh, capability to create this type of stuff. I don't know of any projects that actually build it like, into, the, you know, into the systems or the, the reward mechanisms themselves. But for sure, there's a whole lot of sympathy for uh, people that fight for privacy in this space. So, yeah, I mean, that it's kind of a personal decision whether or not to support it. But I think that the fact that Bitcoin exists creates a whole pool of people and resources to subsidize stuff like that. Thank you for the presentation, I really enjoyed that one. Um, at the very beginning you mentioned this currency as one of the first killer apps that we have. I slightly agree, but the point to me is then you come with this Venezuela or you know, with all the crappy countries where you really look for privacy or to be, have a unique currency and all that stuff. The adoption that I see is only in the countries like the US, Germany, South Korea, or Europe, South Korea, whatever, they all don't have these issues to such an extent. So my question is, how can you scale to the countries that should have the real demand to them, you know, like LeapFrog that we have seen with, in Africa with you know, mobile payments and stuff. How can you bridge that, that you make the on-ramp easier, better apps, whatever, that this people can use blockchain on their smartphone in order to really scale these great concepts or ideas, because I'd rather see the you know, US and other people using it. Yeah, that, I completely agree with you. I, I think this is a problem. In fact, uh, so many people in this industry talk about, uh, say, like Latin America, Venezuela being, or Africa being an extraordinary use case, but the reality is people in these countries don't care about Bitcoin. They, they, most people haven't heard about it, or if they have heard about it, they've unfortunately been victims of like a, a multi-level marketing scheme or something like that, like informed you. So it, it's quite unfortunate. And, uh, this is something that I think about quite a bit, and I view kind of three, uh, a solution pack that involves three main factors. One would be kind of like a, on the product side. You need products that are super easy, intuitive, and people just love. Um, kind of like, we need to Uberize finance. We need to Uberize crypto finance. If you have something like that, that's great. Then you need great marketing around it. You need to actually get people to understand and, and want to use this stuff. Three, something that I think is a little bit underappreciated in the industry is uh, I actually want to see more social science research on this stuff, on how we propagate this type of technology out into areas that are disenfranchised currently. And I think if we combine these three problems, these three factors, I think we'll get a pretty good solution, but probably through a lot of trial and error. <laughs> My thing has always been, if we can't get Venezuelans to use crypto, then we're all screwed. Because they're the perfect market right now. They're being, you know, it, it really is it. What, what, is, what do you think is the best way to penetrate a market that's so heavily controlled, um, uh, but uh, in desperate need of this technology? Yeah, so I, I like the Uber model. Um, which is quite ironic because I checked Uber over here today and I found out that I can't and uh, Jeremy was a little, a little upset. But, um, look, so be it. But what, what Uber did was basically they propagated their technology so rapidly before there could be so much pushback against it. And really the point is to get people to just actually love what you have, the product, and make it go viral. We, we haven't done that yet in the industry. It's really disappointing. But there are Venezuelans whose lives have been made so much better because of technology. I was just in a conference in Bogota in December and you know, we had some really good friends from Colombia and Venezuela and clearly there's a selection you know, mechanism going here. Those whose lives were impacted favorably came to the conference. All right, but the average Venezuela has not had any, any difference in their lives from this stuff. But I mean, I, I think that in, in most of these circumstances, the change has to come from within their own society. You know, just saying that I have a great product that works well in the US or Europe and just 
Tommy, well, here, here you go, and you fund the marketing campaign. That's not going to cut it. You need to actually have people who are kind of like first movers or evangelists locally. Um, so that's, that's what we do, for instance. We have teams in kind of key countries around the world on the ground, like actually building awareness. So I think that's the first step. You know, and, and it seems slow, but I, I can say any exponential process looks linear when you look at it from, you know, close enough. Um, so I, I think that it looks like things are going slow right now, but as soon as you hit a certain critical mass, things could go exponential viral. Guys, are all hungry. Then I, I, I would still have two questions. So I like the idea. Don't get me wrong, but there is one a critical thing. How, how would you, um, how would you prevent misuse of criminals? Because you know, these people also would exactly like to have um, a technology uh, where they would can disguise their data, their transactions, and, and whatever you have shown. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 I clearly get this all the time, even working on a privacy cryptocurrency. Uh, the, the, the reality, though, is that most you know, criminal behavior is done with pallets of US dollars or euro. Right, right now, it, it's just easier for people, which seems a little counterintuitive. But um, when, when you know how this industry works and you know money, there are these on and off ramps, you know, basically with exchanges. These are the points where governments need to look at and, and make sure that there isn't, you know, say, like uh, ISIS or some terrorist group trying to move funds through. It, it's not a 100% foolproof process, clearly, but for, for people who are doing nefarious activity, they, they almost always have to go through uh, a tra transition point from fiat, crypto to fiat. Okay, so, so you would promote privacy within your coin, but at the same time, you would really like to have clear and structured crypto exchanges um, to keep misuse out of the room via this entry door, right? Right. You know, so for me, in a perfect world, we'd see a combination of like very clear, you know, um, you know, regulatory guidance to prevent misuse. So I, I'm, not, I, I'm a big believer in freedom, but I don't think that every rule is a bad one. I think that some rules could be absolutely sensible and you know provide social good. Uh, what I would like to see is a dynamic environment, though, that has kind of a you know the right intelligent kind of streamlined regulations for exchanges and points, you know, of, of exchange, but then also have a dynamic uh, decentralized. You know, uh, changes. Okay. Yeah. okay, and the last question for even for today, not just for now, uh, even for today. Um, uh, what is your prediction for the crypto assets market for this entire year? I know nobody can project yeah. what's happened, but still you have an opinion yeah. maybe and uh, or a gut feeling. Yeah, so okay, guys, this is not investment advice. Just say now, I'll carry that over there. But probably Lambo. Lambo. I mean, okay, so. Um, I, I, I talked to uh, a decent amount of institutions and investors out there, and a lot of them are just starting to move into the space. There was actually news that, that um, you know, my team just informed me of today that Goldman Sachs and Baidu uh, jointly bought Poloniex, a cryptocurrency exchange. So I think, or I'm pretty sure, that there's a lot of institutional players that have been sitting on the sideline and kind of quietly learning what's going on and building up their own um, you know, uh, institutional knowledge but really waiting for some guidance and regulation. I think what they were waiting for was to make sure that there wasn't going to be some heavy hand that just completely shut down of these markets. And I think we're probably crossed a bit of a critical, a critical mass where I would predict that we're going to see uh, a larger involvement of institutions, which means a larger amount of capital around the world flowing in. And this then, of course, uh, leads to uh, dropping prices. Lambo. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> OK. Uh, just joking. Um, so, okay, I think um, for today we had a very, very uh, interesting day in all panels which we had. Um, we, would, we would now have a networking dinner and also something to drink out there. So, whatever you would like to have to drink and eat, um, we will provide it uh, to you outside the area here. Because we also hope that, of course, first you learned uh, a lot during the presentations here, but second, I think it's also um, very important to mix up with people, get to know uh, people here, because the, this entire community is just forming right now, um, and therefore I think it's, it's, it's just nice to have maybe an entire evening uh, of networking after this uh, pretty long day. And once again, I would like to ask this morning again, uh, say thank you to Eric and also to Rami, who is in the room here, because without them, there wouldn't have been any uh, organizationary uh, efforts here. So maybe, Eric, you just 
Dank. Ja. 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 Ja.